Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. For this special episode of Bioscience Talks, I was lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Brian Allen, who's an associate professor at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He joined me to talk about the Lone Star Tick, as well as some other common tick species that pose threats to human health. My hope in doing this episode is that by better understanding the behaviors, ranges, life histories, and so on of these ticks, we can do a better job in minimizing the negative effects that they have on human health. And just as a side note along those lines, uh, because it did come up in the interview, I was once swarmed by Lone Star ticks while hiking through the Great Dismal Swamp. It's an experience I absolutely cannot recommend, and I developed one of the maladies that we talk about in the show. In this case, it was an intense and pretty scary allergy to mammalian meat. We talk a bit about the allergy in the show, but I'll also link to an article about it in the show notes, just in case it's a new topic for any of our listeners. But right now, let's get straight to the interview. Uh, Dr. Allen, thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Okay, so we're going to be talking about ticks today, and specifically, I hope to kind of hone in on the Lone Star Tick. Uh, before we get any further into it, though, I was hoping you could maybe give us a quick introduction to the species. You know, kind of where do they live, how big are they, um, what are their primary hosts, and what's the source of their nuisance to human beings? Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, the Lone Star Tick is distributed throughout the southeast U.S., uh, but it's also found um, pretty far north along the eastern seaboard. It's been found as far north as coastal Maine, uh, and uh, it extends uh, sort of the northwest end of its distribution uh, is Missouri and Illinois, although uh, uh, actually up into Oklahoma as well, although there's evidence that's expanding in a number of directions, and so that, that range uh, is becoming larger with time. Uh, it's only recently, as in the last, say, uh, 20 or 30 years, been discovered to be a vector of disease to humans. And so before that time, it was thought of as a nuisance tick, uh, a tick that bites people but uh, didn't otherwise make them sick. Um, but with the discovery of a number of pathogens transmitted by the Lone Star Tick, we also now know that it's an important disease vector. Uh, it's also uh, just a tick that people find annoying because it's really aggressive. Um, so the ticks will um, be present in large numbers when you enter into their habitats. And so people tend to encounter a lot of these ticks. Uh, they also have a tendency to actually pursue after their hosts. Uh, so they'll actually move along the ground when they pick up the heat or the carbon dioxide uh, signature that a, a mammalian host, uh, including us, um, would exude. And so uh, these ticks will actually chase after us, uh, which I think people find particularly alarming uh, about this tick. And so they're really good at getting on to people. Um, they'll readily bite humans, and we now know that they can also transmit diseases to us. Um, so that's why they cause us a variety of problems. Uh, they're adapted to feed from a wide diversity of wildlife hosts, so there's nothing uh, necessarily drawing them to humans. But because they're so abundant when we enter into the uh, areas where they occur, uh, we tend to encounter them, and, and I think uh, people really find the Lone Star Tick especially unpleasant uh, among the ticks that are out there. Okay, so I want to ask you a follow-up question on um, the honing in on the carbon dioxide. That's that, that's what mosquitoes do as well, right? That's right, yeah. So as uh, vertebrates, we exhale carbon dioxide, and so a number of insects and other arthropods that have adapted to feed on blood uh, have uh, evolved to respond to that signal. So that's something that tells them uh, that a human or a deer or a bird is uh, nearby, and they'll actually follow that carbon dioxide trail to get closer to you. Uh, they might also turn to some other cues once they get closer, but it's one of the ways they track us down. Okay, that's that's incredibly alarming. You know, I think most of us are familiar with, you know, the behavior of the black-legged tick or deer tick, which that one doesn't do that, does it? That tends to be a more passive tick. So what it does more often is referred to as questing, uh, where it climbs up into the vegetation and then it just waits uh, for us to bump into it. And they're still very good at acquiring hosts that way. Uh, if you brush up against a, a black-legged tick, uh, it's quite adept at grabbing onto your clothing or your skin. And, and so you can also encounter those at high rates. Uh, but the Lone Star Tick is more likely to engage in this more active host-seeking behavior where they'll actually chase after you. Uh, how fast are they? Well, not as fast as we are, so that's the good news, I suppose. You can go on a tick. Uh, but if you've ever um, sat down to eat your lunch in the woods in Lone Star Tick Habitat, uh, 
uh, it's impressive uh, how quick you see them moving through the leaf litter. Uh, for a little organism, they can really move. Okay, so that, you know, w- speed wise, this would be something similar to say like an ant or something. Yeah, I'd say that's parallel. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting and, and something of which I was not aware. And also, you know, uh, can we talk just a little bit about the mammalian meat allergy? It's one that I've acquired myself, unfortunately. So if if people have heard the Radio Lab episode um, about uh, alpha gal, this is the tick that's implicated in in that as well, right? Yeah, or it was one of the first ticks implicated in it. And so I'm sorry to hear that you've had it. I've, I've known a number of people who've uh, suffered from that, and it seems like it's uh, really unpleasant. Um, so it's a funny reaction uh, that some people have to the bite of this tick uh, that causes them to develop an allergy to red meat. And people can have a range of reactions, but as I understand it, what's typical is uh, to break out in hives, uh, to experience uh, gastrointestinal upset. Um, and it's uh, a funny reaction that our immune system has to some of the uh, proteins that occur in tick saliva. It doesn't happen to everybody, but uh, the people who have it um, can have a very strong reaction to red meat after having been bitten by a lone star tick. So uh, how long ago did you uh, pick this up? So I picked up the allergy in 2013, and um, I think I was bitten about 50 times by an immature form of the tick, so the larvae or the the nymphal stage. Uh, I never actually saw one, uh, but I I picked up this allergy, and it persisted for a couple of years thereafter. It's since faded, and, you know, I'm, I'm cleared to eat whatever sort of diet I wish. Um, but, you know, part of my motivation here is trying to find out how people can avoid being bitten in the future, particularly those who've already had the allergy, uh, because getting bitten by a Lone Star Tick again can bring it rearing back. Um, and I think that's something we'd all like to avoid. Well, that makes sense that that would be uh, motivating for you. And, um, yeah, what's hard with uh, ticks is that, as you uh, alluded, the different life stages are different sizes. And some of the smallest life stages are really small and very difficult to detect. Uh, so they go through a larval life stage, um, which uh, people often liken to a grain of pepper uh, for how small they are. Um, and because all those larvae hatch from a common egg mass, they tend to be all questing together. And so when you pick them up, you tend to pick up 50 or 100 or, or several hundred of these larvae all at once. Uh, people sometimes call that a tick bomb. Um, the next life stage, which is referred to as the nymphs, uh, are about the size of the head of a lead pencil. Um, and they're also uh, difficult to detect, although they're obviously larger than the larvae. Uh, and then the final adult stage, uh, final life stage are the adults, uh, which are about the size of uh, an eraser on a pencil. And they're uh, much easier to detect. Uh, and that's often when people notice that they have a tick on them. It's that adult life stage that they see crawling on their clothes or even feel crawling on their skin. That's interesting. And, and, and they can bite at all life stages. They can bite at all life stages. But I, I guess, fortunately, that larval life stage tends not to transmit disease to humans because for the most part, these ticks are born without any infections. And so that larval life stage is the first time they try to take a blood meal and so that's their first opportunity to acquire a pathogen from a wildlife host and so as annoying as the larvae are because you can pick them up in large numbers generally speaking they're not infected with pathogens so other than the irritation that they may cause to the skin or or in some cases uh, the meat allergy uh, the larvae don't pose much of a health threat it's those nymphal and adult stages that tend to transmit diseases so what are some of the other diseases that they can carry you know once they've had a blood meal already and potentially been exposed So probably the most prevalent disease associated with the Lone Star Tick is a disease called Ehrlichiosis. It's caused by several bacteria in the genus Ehrlichia, and it's carried by a number of different wildlife species and appears to be present throughout most of the range of the Lone Star Tick. Um, So that's uh, probably the most prevalent uh, tick-borne disease associated with the Lone Star Tick. Uh, It can also transmit several pathogens in the genus Rickettsia. Probably the best well-known pathogen in that group is uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which can also be transmitted by dog ticks. Um, But there are other emerging rickettsial pathogens associated with the long star tick. And then maybe on the more rare side, but uh, on the very dangerous side, is a disease called Tularemia, uh, which has a number of different transmission modes, but... uh, Transmission by the Lone Star Tick is one of them. And then we've recently discovered some viruses associated with the Lone Star Tick, like Heartland virus. And so we're still discovering pathogens that are associated with this tick species. We probably haven't discovered them all yet. Okay, and that's that's a large number of, of potentially serious illnesses. Is there any reason why ticks are, are such, you know, active vectors of 
uh, you know, various illnesses, you know, why, why can we catch so many things from ticks? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So it probably relates to a number of factors, but among them is ticks like the Lone Star Tick are what we refer to as host generalists, meaning they'll feed from a lot of different wildlife species and they'll also bite human hosts. And so because of that, they're probably being exposed to a lot of different pathogens that are associated with different wildlife. Uh, some of these pathogens may be carried by white-tailed deer, some might be carried uh, by rabbits, uh, some might be carried by uh, other vertebrates. And so because the Lone Star Tick will feed on so many different wildlife hosts, that likely creates a lot of opportunities for it to acquire different pathogens, some of which it then transmits to us. Uh, there are other pathogens that they're picking up that are probably specific to wildlife or pose more of a threat to, say, uh, livestock or domestic animals. Um, but in some of these cases, these are pathogens that will make us sick, too. Okay. Um, and you mentioned earlier that their range is expanding, and I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why that might be. You know, I, I guess the, the obvious thing that we would jump to would be to assume that it's climate change, but is there, is there more to it than that as well? So this is a big question right now that uh, uh, quite a few scientists who are interested in ticks and other uh, vector-borne diseases and other infectious diseases are seeing, because we're seeing these range expansions for many different types of infectious diseases. Even for ticks, we're seeing the Lone Star tick is expanding in distribution. The black-legged tick is expanding in distribution. Climate change probably is a component in some of these uh, expanding distributions. And so there's evidence in support of climate change. Uh, there's probably multiple factors occurring simultaneously, though. And so in addition to uh, climate factors, humans are modifying landscapes in ways that might make them more amenable to the establishment of ticks. Uh, fragmentation of forest habitats is uh, one potential explanation for this, that we're creating uh, landscapes with a, a high degree of heterogeneity in them that allow certain wildlife populations like white-tailed deer to really thrive. And with those larger host populations, that might be supporting larger tick populations. We also think wildlife are moving ticks around. Uh, some aspects of human uh, commerce or, or travel might be moving ticks around as well. And so we may be increasing the rate at which ticks are being seeded into new areas. And then those areas might be more receptive for the establishment of tick populations than they were previously. And so it's hard to pin down, say, just one factor that's responsible for these expanding ranges of ticks and, and their pathogens. It may be multiple factors occurring simultaneously, but we think a lot of it is, is associated with the way humans change the environment. And I just wanted to hit on one of the things you mentioned, you know, that the humans uh, might be spreading the ticks around by moving their hosts around. What would be an example of that? Well, uh, there are a number of different uh, ideas that have uh, been proposed along those lines. Uh, you know, if we go back 75 years to when white-tailed deer populations were actually quite low, there were efforts to uh, reestablish deer populations in a number of states. And that resulted in transporting of deer from places where they were uh, remnant or where they still had uh, thriving populations to areas where their populations had gone, uh, population numbers had gone quite low. And it's been hypothesized that that may have moved some ticks around the country at that time. Uh, we don't have the ability to uh, follow up on that hypothesis, uh, but that's at least one idea for what has helped to establish the ranges of these ticks was uh, deer reestablishment programs. Okay, and now let's talk about the landscape a little bit. So you mentioned that landscape heterogeneity, so a lot of different landscape types and um, I guess levels of human impact as well. What are the, the worst landscape features that humans create? Or you know, what are some scenarios in terms of the landscape that are uh, particularly troublesome in terms of allowing the establishment of, of large tick populations? So that's been really well studied in the context of black-legged ticks and Lyme disease. And so I'll, I'll tell you that in that context, it looks like the suburban landscape, or what is sometimes referred to as the exurban landscape, so where there's sort of slightly lower uh, human uh, residential development outside of suburban areas, that seems to be the landscape that really promotes high risk of Lyme disease, uh, both from the perspective of kind of the perfect combination of wildlife hosts and habitats, but also high rates of human exposure because you have humans living right at that interface with nature. Um, so that kind of intermediate level of forest cover, uh, sometimes with some level of agriculture mixed in, can create really high densities of white-tailed deer, which are a very important host for the black-legged tick. It can also create high densities of small mammals, which are often very important reservoirs for the Lyme pathogen. And so it puts all of the key players in the Lyme disease transmission system all in close contact with each other. You have a high abundance of wildlife hosts, high densities of ticks, 
and high contact rates of humans uh, with that environment in which Lyme disease transmission occurs. That's interesting. And I, I think I'd read somewhere that they were having trouble um, or that they're troublesome to eradicate too because they rely heavily on a mouse host that is difficult to get rid of, even if you're able to, you know, limit or lower the numbers of white-tailed deer. That's right. So that's one of the challenges is, is how to try to manage Lyme disease in those landscapes. And some communities engage in deer reduction programs. It's not entirely clear how effective that is at reducing Lyme disease risk. Uh, similarly, efforts to treat the small mammal population are really challenging because that's actually a much larger number of animals uh, at a higher density, so they have much smaller home range sizes, and so you can pack a lot of mice into a small area. Uh, but there are some really interesting ideas that are in development, including trying to deliver a Lyme vaccine to uh, mice, perhaps through a bait delivery system, uh, also trying to apply topical pesticides to small mammals, perhaps by providing them uh, with bedding materials that have been treated with these pesticides that they'll then bring back to their nests and be in frequent contact with and that might control tick feeding on mice. And so there's some real ingenuity in some of the uh, solutions that are being explored at the moment, but it will be challenging because of the scale, just the amount of space over which uh, this problem exists. And these same considerations that we're talking about right now for the black leg tick are um, equally applicable or similarly applicable to the Lone Star tick? There are some parallels, certainly. In, in a sense, the Lone Star tick is, is perhaps a simpler uh, tick to deal with uh, in the sense that some of the research that I and others have performed indicates that white-tailed deer really are the key host in that system. Um, so all three life stages of the Lone Star tick uh, happily feed on white-tailed deer. Uh, there's also evidence that it's playing that role as being the pathogen reservoir. Um, and so it's not to say it's the only host influencing the ecology of diseases transmitted by the Lone Star Tick, but it might be the big player. And so management solutions that focused on preventing ticks from feeding on deer would probably be really effective in the Lone Star Tick system. That's interesting. And, you know, I was noting earlier we were talking about the landscape features. Um, some of your work is also focused on the role that invasive plants might play. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about honeysuckle and how that plays a part? Sure. So um, some research I performed in Missouri looking at uh, the ecology of the Lone Star Tick there indicated that invasive plants, particularly uh, one of the most common invasive shrubs uh, throughout a lot of eastern North, uh, North America, uh, uh, bush honeysuckle, seems to create at least pockets of high tick-borne disease risk. And we think that's because... Uh, again, that key host, the white-tailed deer, seems to be attracted to uh, taking refuge in bush honeysuckle patches. And so when you get invasion of a forest understory by this honeysuckle, it creates this really dense thicket that deer, uh, I think, will use as refuge, particularly during the daytime or times when they're not feeding. And so that seems to be a place where they're concentrated. A lot of ticks are able to acquire them there, feed on them, then drop off, and then they're more likely to encounter another deer. And so it seems to be creating these hot spots in the landscape where you have a lot of deer tick contact. And what was cool is that we actually did an experiment to ask if you remove honeysuckle, do you remove that hot spot from the landscape? And we found out that the answer is that it, it does. And so we experimentally cleared honeysuckle in the same way that managers would just for, say, biodiversity uh, uh, purposes. And the tick-borne disease risk went right back down to what it had been in, in natural landscapes that hadn't been invaded by honeysuckle. And so it actually suggested a, a, something of a win-win scenario that many managers are already removing honeysuckle because it's viewed as this noxious invader with all these other negative consequences. But our work showed that if you remove it from those areas, you also uh, reduce tick-borne disease risk in, in doing so. So how does this compare up with things like prescribed burns? I remember reading somewhere, and it may have been in your work, um, that they were not so successful. So is this one better? Yeah, I don't know that there's been a direct comparison between these management approaches. You're giving me ideas for things uh, <laughs> that I should should be working on. Uh, but yes, uh, it seems like it's one eff effective approach and one that particularly lends itself to that suburban landscape um, because that's where we're seeing a lot of this invasion taking place. Um, it's, it tends to be in these more disturbed natural habitats. Um, and so it's, it's a landscape in which a lot of human contact with ticks is likely occurring. And then something like prescribed fire is harder to apply in that type of landscape. 
And so, yeah, we might need to think about different management solutions for different parts of the of the landscape where tick-borne disease occurs. And are there other any you know are there any other landscape management approaches um, that are being tried or have been tried uh, for managing either the Lone Star tick um, you know or Lyme disease carrying ticks? Sure. Well, so the jury's still out on fire. So I've I've got a, a research project right now where we're studying that in the context of Lone Star ticks. Um, so stay tuned, and I'll I'll give you some uh, thing of an update on on how prescribed fires influence tick populations. Uh, there's another cool uh, strategy that actually I think has been established as working. It's just somewhat uh, labor intensive, uh, which is uh, feeding stations for deer that force them to apply a tick specific pesticide when they feed from the feeder. It's called a four poster and it's effectively got these paint rollers next to uh, uh, little feeding trays and these paint rollers you soak in permethrin or, or some other, uh, what we would call an acaricide, a pesticide that kills ticks. And so when the deer come in to feed, they have to rub up against this paint roller, and then they end up through their grooming spreading the acaricide over the rest of their bodies. And it's been shown to locally reduce tick populations, and so it works. Uh, the challenge is to put out enough of these that one could actually meaningfully impact uh, the population of ticks in an area. Um, but it's something that's... Uh, I think an ingenious solution in the sense that you're getting the uh, pesticide directly to the host that's playing such a key role in uh, disease dynamics. Okay, and as a you know as a, a tick related problem sufferer, I, I've done my homework on permethrin, uh, but I should ask for for our listeners, uh, permethrin it doesn't hurt the deer, does it? No, uh, I don't believe there's any evidence that uh, it would harm the deer uh, in that kind of a management scenario. So that's a another possible approach. Um, to lowering tick abundances, uh, you know, in a widespread way. Another question then is, you know, we've we've talked a lot about the bad uh, things about you know lone star ticks and other ticks. Uh, do they do any good? It, you know, do they serve an important ecological purpose in any way? If you're something other than you know a uh, tick-borne illness. Yeah, I love that topic because I think for many people that's the thing that they converge on in talking about ticks or mosquitoes is, is what good could these organisms possibly serve? Um, and it's a fair question, I think, from our perspective, because we often assign value uh, to things in nature. So we think of pollinators as being good because they provide this service of uh, pollinating food crops for us. Uh, we think of ticks as being bad because they, they transmit diseases. Uh, you know, my first answer to that is, you know, from nature's perspective, there's, there's no good or bad. These are organisms that occupy niches in nature and uh, attempt to complete their life cycles. I would answer that one reason perhaps why ticks have become so problematic in places like North America and Europe might be in part as a result of the loss of predators. And so I'm talking about things like mountain lions and wolves uh, that historically might have controlled populations of their prey like white-tailed deer. And in the absence of those predators, there's some really interesting recent work that suggests that that has in many ways released these parasite populations that more effective control of those prey populations would create fewer hosts for ticks and as a result perhaps uh, lower this landscape of tick-borne disease risk. And so some of this may be a historical consequence of the way humans previously altered the ecosystems in which we live and the loss of those top predators could have these cascading effects uh, that ultimately impact human health. Okay, that's that's interesting. Now, um, one thing I wanted to get into was, you know, how people might personally uh, avoid becoming bitten by ticks. And I, I think that kind of might play into another question, which is, um, how do you conduct research on these things? You know, how do you collect them? How do you deal with them? Obviously, you described removing bush honeysuckle in the field in Missouri, um, which is a thought that just simply terrifies me on its face. Um how do you do it and how do you avoid being bitten and how can others do the same? Well, so I pretty much do the opposite of what everybody else does, which is I head right into those ticky areas. And so I'm not avoiding ticks. And in fact, a number of our collection methods uh, depend on us picking up ticks on our own bodies. Um, so we have a few different strategies for doing tick surveillance. Uh, for black-legged ticks, for example, where they're primarily uh, questing in the vegetation, uh, the general strategy is to drag a white cloth through the vegetation and the ticks will grab onto it thinking it's a passing host. Uh, but they grab onto us while we're doing that as well. And so we tend to wear uh, protective clothing um, 
the white coveralls uh, that we use to create as sort of complete a physical barrier as we can. And then we pick the ticks off of ourselves as well as off of the cloth. For Lone Star ticks, because they, uh, in those later life stages, will aggressively pursue a host, uh, we use a carbon dioxide trap in many cases to collect those. Um, so that's a lunch cooler uh, with holes drilled in the side, and we put carbon dioxide, or sorry, we put dry ice in the cooler, which is frozen carbon dioxide. As the dry ice sublimates, it releases gaseous CO2, and that attracts the ticks. And we put double-sided carpet tape around the outside of the trap. And so when the ticks come close to the cooler, they become ensnared in the tape, and then we can come along and pick them up. And, you know, on those on those coveralls, I'm imagining you're not able to treat those with any sort of, you know, um, chemical poison, are you? No, we don't use any kind of repellents because we're trying to collect ticks. Yeah, you're, tr- you're trying to collect them and collect them alive, I assume. Exactly. So it's often one of the, the hardest conversations I have with my, my students and my technicians is explaining that we can't use repellents because uh, we're in the business of collecting these ticks. Um, so, so that's something that I would recommend to the, the general public is uh, repellents uh, be part of the strategy. Uh, but the rest of the things that we do have actually been proven to be very effective. Um, so one is to try to make your clothing as continuous a barrier against ticks as possible. So tuck your pants into your socks, tuck your shirt into your pants, try to create this continuous layer that's very hard for the ticks to get through. Uh, Second, and this has been uh, well studied, is that doing tick checks after you've entered into tick habitat is one of the best preventative strategies you can take. So at the end of a hike, give yourself and your clothes a very good look over to see if you have any ticks that are currently crawling on you. And then when you get home, do a really thorough tick check. Um, So often before people shower is the best time to do this. Remove your clothes, get in front of a mirror, uh, and really give yourself a thorough inspection uh, to see if you can find any ticks that are starting to attach. For some tick diseases, there's a little bit of time to remove the tick uh, before you get exposed. And so that's one benefit, at least, to dealing with ticks is that there's time to find them and remove them. Okay. And so, you know, continuous clothing, use of repellents, and then primarily making sure that you remove any ticks from your body, whether they've attached or not, as soon as you possibly can. Exactly. Yeah, that combination of strategies is very effective. Well, that's good news. Um, One thing that I've been wondering since I personally became highly tick aware is, you know, are there times of year that the threat is greater or lesser than other times? You know, if you look at sort of the lay literature, the advice is always, if it's possibly going to be above freezing, uh, be vigilant. And, you know, of course we will do that. But are there times of year that, you know, we should be especially vigilant or, uh, you know, when we might slack off a little bit and maybe do our tick checks uh, a couple hours after we get home or something like that? Yes. Yes. There are times of year that are better and worse, for sure. So during the summer is when most people encounter ticks. Um, So uh, the nymphal stage of the black-legged tick and the nymphal stage of the lone star tick are most active in the middle of the summer, uh, when humans also tend to be most active in the outdoors. Uh, Adult lone star ticks are active in the late spring, and adult black-legged ticks are active in the early spring and late fall. And so right in the dead of winter should be pretty safe from ticks. Um, and even in the uh, spring and fall, you're mostly dealing with the adult life stages, which tend to be larger and easier for people to detect. Um, so I would say summer is the time when people need to be most vigilant. Uh, spring and fall, they still need to be careful. And uh, during the winter, uh, if people uh, still want to recreate outside, that's the time of year when you're generally safest from uh, tick encounters. Okay, that's very useful to know. What's next for your research? What are you looking at right now, and what should we be on the lookout for in the future from uh, your lab? Well, thanks for asking. So one of the main points we're focusing on now is trying to put a lot of these pieces together. Um, So we have evidence that climate change is impacting tick-borne disease risk, evidence that things like invasive plants and prescribed fire uh, can influence the abundance of ticks in the environment as well. And so one of the things I'm really interested in doing is trying to assemble these pieces into a single model. So can we try to understand how climate change will influence these processes and how that will all cascade down to tick-borne disease risk, including through changes in the prevalence of fire in the landscape and through changes in the prevalence of invasive plants in the landscape. And so to me, that's one of the next big challenges in tick biology is to ask, can we assemble all the parts of this story and really try to understand what's next for tick-borne disease. We're seeing ongoing emergence of both ticks and the pathogens associated with them. And so I don't think this problem is going away from a a human health standpoint. 
And so part of the question is, can we get out ahead of it in terms of our understanding and actually try to predict or project what's going to happen next and hopefully be better prepared to respond to this public health crisis? Uh, we're certainly attuned to it, and there's uh, considerable public health resources being devoted uh, to trying to solve the problem. But personally, I would love to get into a more proactive framework where we can actually anticipate uh, what are the next uh, problems we're going to face in tick-borne disease and try to get out ahead of those. And I, I think I and all of those listening would also be very welcoming of that. Dr. Allen, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time. Thank you.